winters are warming faster than any other season in Canada. So, you know, when you talk about ice rinks, whether indoor or outdoor, when you talk about snow, that, that's why we're seeing these consequences so meaningfully because w the winter is where we're experiencing it the most. And, and what, a, what an effect it's going to have on Canadian culture, on our hockey culture, on our, on our winter heritage. It, it's it's kind of sad to think about it. Welcome back to Let's Talk About Water. This is a podcast about the future of our planet's water and why you should care. I'm your host, Jay Familietti. As we are all painfully aware, 2020 is the year of the COVID-19 pandemic. Many people were stuck inside their homes for days on end. To get away from life on the inside, people flocked outdoors in search of some healthy recreation, which is great. But with changing climate, you might not get as many seasons as you'd like out of those new cross-country skis. Here in Canada, we're warming at twice the global rate. In Saskatoon, three times the global rate. For some ski resorts, that means they won't be able to make snow. They may not have snow at all. It also means algal blooms will be a common occurrence across our favorite lakes in the summer. And what about our local orchards and wine production? As our climate changes, we may be able to find poutine anywhere, but accessing alpine skiing and a slime-free lake will become more and more difficult. Today, Micah Hewer and Pat Lightsmith are here to help me slalom through the steep slopes of how climate change is impacting outdoor recreation across Canada. Micah Hewer is an applied climatologist at the University of Toronto in Scarborough who studies the impacts of climate change on recreation and tourism and on wine production in Canada. Michael, welcome to the program. Thanks, Jay. First of all, let's let's talk about climate change. Can you, can you give us the big picture about how climate change is impacting Canada? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so, I mean, when I when I think about climate change, I I, I try to uh, to limit my my perspective to what has been observed and what's been documented with the instrumental records. So so I generally focus my my attention and and my discussions around the last 150 years which really uh, we have instrumental records for that. And we also have something very important that happened in that time frame, which was the industrial revolution. And so ever since we started uh, emitting greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide, especially, then uh, eventually those accumulated in the atmosphere and we started to be able to, to witness and to observe and to document changes, uh, anthropogenic changes in the climate system. Um, but when we're talking about climate change, it's interesting because globally, uh, we've seen about a one degree warming. But in a Canadian context, that's been amplified. And we've seen almost two degrees of warming already over the last 100 years in a Canadian context. And it's actually even greater than that in the Canadian Arctic. So although uh, you might not expect that Canada would be, you know, one of the, the greater impacted countries because does it really matter to, you know are, are canadians really feeling the heat uh, do we care that it got a degree warmer that seems kind of like a benefit to most canadians you would expect um, but we we have started to see some real negative impacts especially in regards to um, for example from a tourism context the ski industry is certainly not celebrating the one degree or two degree warming that they've they've experienced and and nor are the communities that are on fire no no so we should talk about both the cold side and the and the warm side so let's talk about the snow season uh, a little bit so so what's happening there on the cold side of, of climate change most canadians live uh, in, in southern Canada, which is really what I, I like to refer to as a transition zone, because a lot of these regions, you think about Toronto, you think about um, even uh, Montreal, Calgary, not so much Vancouver, that's a bit of a unique discussion. But a lot of our, our populated cities live in a transition zone where a one degree warming, especially a two degree warming, is going to move these these areas from being characterized by harsh 
cold, snowy winters into, into climates that are much more similar to Vancouver, where we're receiving much more rain than snow because our average temperatures are so close to the freezing point. And uh, I, I did some research recently in Toronto to document that, to, uh, to quantify that, and to really show that, that um, winters in Toronto are, are much more rainy than snowy compared to what, what they used to be. Um, and, and I mean, that's the science, but you even just think about the lived experience. I mean, I'm, uh, I'm 37, and, it, and the interesting thing about, about 37 is that I can look back to a, to a different climate. Climate's generally characterized by about 30 years. 30 years of, of time characterizes a climate normal. And so if I remember back when I was seven years old, I lived in a very different climate where we used to get snow blowing up against the front of our house and you couldn't open the door. And, and nowadays, and I have kids that are, I have some uh, children that are about seven and they're hard pressed to get a snow day or, or even opportunity to play in the snow. Never mind, uh, you know, be barricaded in the house by a snowstorm. And so you can really see um, very, very uh, real changes especially in our winters. Yeah, so let's talk about that a little bit. I mean, I think generally there's an expectation that um, with the, uh, and thank you for pointing out that Canada is warming at twice the global rate. And uh, we learned yesterday that uh, Saskatchewan is warming at three times the, the global rate. And so the impacts on the snow season, I mean, what are you seeing? I've thought about it a lot, but I haven't quantified it. And I'm not sure that anybody has in a Canadian context, but but I really think that you would see uh, a shorter winter and a longer summer, just generally speaking. And that obviously has um, dire consequences for for industries that depend on ice and snow, such as the alpine, uh, well, all, all ski-based industries. I mean, with alpine skiing, they have some adaptation capacity. They can they can make artificial snow to a degree, but it's expensive and it's it has obviously uh, the water and environmental consequences, energy consequences as well. Um, but there's even a threshold for that where the, the the ski season in Canada, especially in Ontario and Quebec, where elevation is relatively low, uh, the ski season is really contracting and it's costing the producers much more uh, money in order to to create a, a skiable terrain. I'm just really curious about how these resorts might shift to survive. Can they shift to other sorts of resort activities, more summer-based things, more more activities in the shoulder seasons? Yeah, certainly they can and they have been to such a degree that um, you think about uh, from my from my own perspective, because I live in southern Ontario, the largest resort in, in kind of a two hour uh, drive for for us is uh, Blue Mountain is the largest and probably most profitable resort in southern Ontario. And uh, they have really uh, exercised that adaptation strategy so that, uh, it, you know, the, the resort was built and the community is 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 reliant on the ski industry. But the ski industry really only characterizes a, a, at best three months of the year and the rest of the year there and most of their investment is now going into a, a four season style resort where they they still have the the mountain terrain and they're using it for for warm weather activities that can that can make up at least six months of the year things like downhill uh downhill mountain biking zip lining um hiking and, and a variety of other uh, activities that they can do on, on the, that terrain that doesn't require snow and ice in order for it to be enjoyable. Yeah, so that, that's great. And that seems completely appropriate. And it's just the way the, the world is, is going. I'm sure this is happening all, all around the all around the world. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, ice and what you're seeing with changes in ice. And of course, you know, we love ice here in Canada. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about um, the future of the backyard ice rink. Back, remember when we used to play hockey in Canada? Yeah, yeah. On on ponds, <laughs> you know, I would not recommend. I would not recommend my kids going out onto any ponds anytime in the near future. And and I remember as a kid, we used to always go skating and play hockey on ponds. And and I mean that's just uh, recreational. But you think also about the communities that have outdoor rinks. 
that's another topic. Like, I mean, we have an outdoor rink downtown Hamilton by the uh, by the waterfront, and I, I I'm very curious about the how how much money it costs to maintain that. Um, and then you can also talk about indoor rinks. What is the what's the consequence of climate change for running all of our indoor hockey rinks? How much uh, additional energy do they need to consume? How much money is it costing them to maintain those rinks as as winters and, and both spring and fall continue to get warmer and warmer? And that's one last point that I'd like to emphasize that winters are warming faster than any other season in Canada. So, you know, when you talk about ice rinks, whether indoor or outdoor, when you talk about snow, that, that's why we're seeing these consequences so uh so meaningfully because with the winter is where we're experiencing it the most and and what a what an effect it's going to have on canadian culture on our hockey culture on our on our winter heritage um it, it's it's kind of sad to think about it uh and and but certainly time goes on and, and we'll have to adapt and evolve as as everyone else does as well Let's talk about a little more about the the warm side of of climate change in Canada. So, what do you think are ways that we can adapt for recreation in a warming climate here in in Canada and other um, high latitude locations around the world? Well, adaptation uh, in that regard seems to be somewhat um, natural. It doesn't necessarily require a lot of prompting or planning and what happens is that when temperatures and conditions just simply become uncomfortable in july and august which are generally speaking perceived as our peak tourism season um, it, people just simply start to to naturally uh, broaden that shoulder season so that so that eventually we'll no longer see a peak in july and august and we'll start to actually see a dip in July and August, and June and September will begin to peak for certain activities, as it does, especially in in, in the South. And and the, and that's a great thing to to kind of to consider. And we refer to it as a, a climate analog. And in this regard, it's a spatial climate analog, where we look to the South, where how how do tourists behave, how do recreational seasons operate in the South? And then we can use that as an expectation for what's likely going to happen here in the future when um, climate change makes our, our conditions uh, then what they are now in the South. And, and so that's what we refer to as a spatial analog. And it can be used for tourism. It can be used for agriculture. It can be used for a number of activities. And, and certainly that's an effective mechanism to plan and to prepare for adaptation. I have been looking forward to chatting with you about uh, what you're finding uh, uh, in wine production. So can you share any of your insights? Yeah, sure. So um, wine, the study of climate change and wine is even younger than than tourism and climate change. We've been looking at tourism and climate. I published a paper uh, entitled 30 Years of Assessing the Impact of Climate Change on Tourism. And so that, you know, basically we've been doing that for about three decades now. But in the case of, of grape and wine, um, I, I uh, had a little bit of interest in it because I went to school uh, in St. Catharines, which is a, w one of the, the most um, recognized wine growing regions of Canada in the Niagara Peninsula. And, and so when I, I had the interest and I decided to look at it a little bit. And so I, I jumped on, the, on that boat and wanted to get involved with that type of research. So that's what we started doing. But because it's such a, a new topic, really all we've been able to do so far is look at how uh, climate change is, is affecting key indicators and critical thresholds for grape and wine. Things like uh, growing degree days, things like extreme temperatures, uh, heat stress, freeze damage, frost potential. And overall, what we're seeing is that that our growing season is getting longer. It's becoming warmer. Um, and that's a, that's a positive. But within that, we're also experiencing greater heat stress. And, and you mentioned this previously, so the number of hot days. And what it really relates to in the end is that when we started growing uh, grapes for wine production in Canada, we were considered cool climate viticulture. And so we, we were growing specific grapes, generally speaking, uh, white wine. 
white wine was most uh, suitable for, for Canadian viticulture. And, and that's what we were growing and that's what was thriving here. But as climate continues to warm, we've already actually transitioned out of cool climate viticulture classifications. And so growers are beginning to grow more red wine. And this has been seen in France as well. Uh, if you talk to, to wine growers in France, they'll tell you that, yeah, we used to grow white and now we're growing almost predominantly red. And, and it, that is stressing the need for adaptation. If we don't adapt, we're going to end up with poor quality white and we're going to miss the opportunity of capitalizing on high quality red that actually sells for a higher market value anyways. But I, I just want to wrap it up by saying it's a good thing that I really prefer red wine. So if there's a silver lining, <laughs> um, you know, that that could be it. This is true. Micah Hewer is an applied climatologist at the University of Toronto in Scarborough who studies the impacts of climate change on recreation and tourism and wine production in Canada. It was great having you on, Micah. Thanks very much. Jay, it's a pleasure to be part of this. Pat Lloyd-Smith is an assistant professor in the Department of Agricultural and Resource Economics and a member of the Global Institute for Water Security at the University of Saskatchewan. His research focuses on the economics of water and ecosystem services. Pat, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Jay. It's great to be here. So well, where were you raised? So like the with the pond hockey disappearing, were you, were you raised you know, closer, more down south? This is uh, the kicker. So I was raised in Vancouver where there was no pond hockey. So when I finally moved out east, I uh, got my first taste of it when I was like 18. And I was like a kid that just had sugar for the first time. So I was just like out there all the time. And my mom wasn't even around to say, hey, come on back. Come on in uh, for dinner. So I was just out there tons. So I, I, I've been kind of late to it, but I've uh, really enjoyed it since. Well, but it's really tough to see it to see it disappear, especially, especially for our kids. You know, I, I was the same way. I, I was raised on, uh, not pond hockey, but pond skating. Uh, and it's, it's disappeared. This is down in, uh, in Rhode Island in the United States. It's, you know, it's unsafe now. So places that I used to skate, you, know, you can't do it anymore. So where are you teaching your kids to skate? Well, uh, she's eight months. So I'm, uh, that's I'm only, not, that's I know, not I'm soon. Only, I know I'm only teaching her to skate in my mind, but I, I've already visualized it out at Boffins, out at that little pond out uh, there. So uh, I've already uh, I've already laid down some tracks for her. Okay, very good. So Pat, you have a big focus on recreation economics. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm interested in uh, recreation because it's one of the most tangible ways that people experience nature. They benefit from nature. And there's a lot of really interesting questions in terms of human behavior, human values for the environment and how people's recreation behavior influences the environment and then how the environment influences people's recreation behavior. Uh, as an economist, it's a um, fascinating area of research because when we're talking about how people receive benefits from recreation, we have to move beyond just the data of what people are spending on recreation to really understand, well, what's actually the benefit they're receiving from uh, recreation activities. So tell us a little bit about some of those benefits. We're understanding more and more from a whole range of disciplines of the mental health benefits, the physical benefits, um, spiritual benefits, cultural benefits that people receive from recreation. So people have all these diverse uh, reasons for why they recreate, why they enjoy the outdoors. As, uh, as an economist, when we think about them, we uh, we don't necessarily try and understand the sort of drivers of why, you know, is this sort of a cultural reason? Is this, are you doing this hunting for the subsistence uh, uh, for the food itself? But really trying to understand of sort of this comprehensive picture of what are the sort of impacts on someone's well-being from participating in these activities. So now you have me concerned um, about how the well-being will suffer in the face of climate change and environmental degradation. Do you have any examples for what's going on and, and how these changes are impacting uh, how people recreate? 
you know, I mean, one of the aspects of climate change is it just is going to have so many different Im impacts. And we think of recreation, one of the first thoughts is we're, um, especially here in Canada, we're worried about our winter sports activities. So we think of all these snow based activities, we have warmer uh, weather, shorter winters, those are going to suffer. And so those are kind of front of mind, and we can uh, seek to understand those. But even broader than that, of even when we're thinking of some of our summertime activities, or activities that aren't necessarily so temperature driven, climate change can still have some indirect impact on these recreation activities. For example, there's uh, um, concerns that climate change will increase the frequency and severity of algae blooms. So you have sort of really bad water quality at lakes that are popular for swimming, fishing, and boating. And so even in for these summer-based activities, they can be negatively impacted uh, by climate change. Um, I'm wondering if you're able to put any dollar values on some of these losses, either due to climate change or uh, algal blooms or, you know, whatever. So I've been uh, working on one study looking at uh, the impacts of poor water quality for recreation in Alberta and on uh, camp or lakes that are in provincial parks. And I've been working with a young researcher, Nassim Amini Karzi. And she, uh, we've been uh, trying to understand what, exactly this question of what are the impacts of these sort of beach uh, and swimming advisories on people's recreation behavior. And the nice thing about it is it's, you, you're starting at an individual level to kind of understand how people respond, right? Because unlike a lot of sort of physical impacts of climate change, you have this sort of human behavior element where people are going to adapt to changing environmental conditions. So if you have poor water quality in one lake, they may just go to a different lake or they may change their trip to a different time of year. So when we're trying to understand what these impacts are, we need to understand all these different uh, sort of substitution possibilities that people have with their recreation activities. In, in that case in Alberta, it was uh, sort of the cost of having poor water quality was about $15 per camping trip. And so when we just think of all the camping trips that occur, that can sort of scale up to be a larger number, but even just bringing it down to that individual level uh, can be important for uh, understanding sort of these numbers. You know, you mentioned something about how um, you know people are modifying their behavior. What what kind of options do you think they have when we think about a few different outdoor activities? It might be fishing, it might be hunting. You know, it's not clear to me. And where I'm going with it is, you know, how free are people uh, because of their circumstances? Uh, you know, if they're tied to their jobs. You know, COVID is one example where people are working from home and maybe have more flexibility uh, over their schedules. But just in general, do you have any insight into how flexible, you know, how easy is it for people to shift gears? It's a, it's a challenging question. And part of it is you have a huge diversity um, across uh, the spectrum for people. So I like to think of the substitution, you can think of like spatial substitution. So people don't go to this lake, they go to a different lake. Again, that assumes that there's other lakes of better water quality that are nearby. And that may or may not be the case. But then you can also th think of that temporal substitution. So I'm not going to go this weekend. I'm going to go next weekend. I'm not going to go during the day. I'm going to go at night to avoid maybe some of the uh, hotter temperatures. And I think temporally that there's a lot of challenges there because people's sort of leisure time is not as flexible in a lot of different elements because of work schedules, because of when up when they're friends or family that uh, they want to also have time off. So there's a lot of other kind of coordination costs. So that limit this ability to just sort of participate in these activities. Have you made a stab at looking at how quantifying how these things are impacted by uh, environmental change, environmental degradation? It's a big uh, challenge, but it's really important. And one of the, one of the limitations of the sort of existing recreation economics uh, work is a lot of it's focused on the spending. So it's thinking about recreation and the expenditures that people spend to participate in all these activities and what, what that does for the economy. So you often hear that, uh, that type of language and that can be really important for different sort of local areas and different regions. But one of the downsides of focusing on the spending as sort of a proxy for the benefits of recreation is it misses out on the actual benefits that people receive, 
right? It's just a focus on expenditure. And so if expenditures go up, then that's great. But when we actually try and think of step back and think about what the benefits are that people actually receive from the recreation, not what they're spending, we get this more complete picture because it allows us to incorporate all these different dimensions and reasons for participating. And sort of the outcome of that is that, you know, in Canada, there's estimates that uh, Canadians spend about $40 billion a year on recreation. And so that number often gets touted as sort of, isn't that, isn't recreation so important? But that's actually a, a gross underestimate of what the benefits Canadians receive from recreation, not what they're spending. And when we look at what they're receiving, it's closer to about $100 billion based on some estimates with some uncertainty there. But what that sort of shows is because we're so focused on the spending that people have, we might be sort of under investing in recreation underestimating the impacts of things like climate change or other environmental change will have on recreation and the values it provides to people. One of the elements in the recreation world is there's a lot of emphasis on hunting and fishing. One of the reasons is a lot of people that study this tend to also participate in those activities. Those activities are important. Those activities have really high values for, per participant per person that's actually participating in this activity. But there's also a whole other broader range of recreation activities that are probably underrepresented in the literature that are important for people. So I'm thinking of a lot of sort of non-consumptive recreation activities like bird watching, um, different types of hiking, things where people maybe have less of an impact on the environment. And maybe the sort of per day values might be lower, but there's a lot more people participating in these activities. So when we're thinking about recreation and the impacts of climate change, it's important to take a look at this sort of more broader um, comprehensive picture of what sort of recreation uh, is. Yeah, so I think that's a great point, Pat, because, um, you know, one of the things that has uh, gotten uh, me and my, my wife through the, the pandemic is um, that we go out and we walk our dog three times a day. And we're we're outside. We often walk along the South Saskatchewan River. And if there were, you know, conditions that change, you know, if the water were contaminated, you know, the weather is the weather is bad. We, you know, we don't walk as much. Um, and so, what I'm trying to say is, this is like a core outdoor activity that we ha we do every day. We've been doing it for years, and more so during the pandemic. And in a sense. No one, and that's probably true for lots and lots of people around the world. And I haven't really seen that. Your point is is well taken. Like this is not really included in these in these estimates of you know the benefits of recreation. Yeah, and you know, I I, I mean, in some ways, there's good reasons to focus on hunting and fishing because you there's a lot of sort of resource management issues because you're actually taking fish or you're taking deer or different. Uh, um, animals out of the environment. So, you you know, there's a lot of management issues at play there. But when we start thinking about how people benefit from nature and how climate change can impact people's recreation activities, I think it's important to take that sort of broader perspective. What's your level of optimism about uh, affecting change in the areas that you work and and uh, across Canada? I'm an optimist at heart, uh, so I'm I'm very optimistic, and I, I I think there's a real opportunity to you know, and we're seeing it across a whole bunch of different spaces that different sort of actions we're doing actually don't cost that much. They cost less than we think when we think of a lot of renewable energy uh, potentials with just technology changes reducing those costs, and we're seeing that in a whole bunch of different spheres. And the benefits are actually quite large. You know, going back to our recreation example, for a long time, we've just been valuing things using expenditures. But if we actually value them using benefits, it's over twice as large. So, you know, I think we're starting to really understand just the potential for these and the sort of really big benefit cost ratios that a lot of these relatively simple initiatives and uh, projects can have. Well, that's great, Pat. Uh, thanks very much for joining us today. Pat Lloyd-Smith is an assistant professor in the Department of Agricultural and Resource Economics and a member of the Global Institute for Water Security at the University of Saskatchewan. It was a pleasure, Pat. Thanks for having me, Jay. It's been fun. Remember, everyone has an intrinsic connection with water. Go find yours in the great outdoors.
Well, that's it for another week of Let's Talk About Water, which is produced by the Global Institute for Water Security at the University of Saskatchewan with the Walrus Lab. I'm your host, Jay Family Eddy. Thanks to everyone who helped put the show together, including Mark Ferguson, Laura McFarland, Amy Hergut, Jesse Widow, Sean Ahmed, Stacey Demansky, Aaron Stevens, Nikki Manfredi, and our producer, Sean Perpick. As always, special thanks to Linda Lilienfeld. This is our last show of 2020, and I know you won't want to miss what we have in store for next year. So why don't you make it easy for yourself and set an alert so you'll know the moment the new episode drops. Remember, we're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and many other quality podcasting platforms. You can also stream us on Facebook at Let's Talk About Water Podcast, or follow us on Twitter at LTAW Podcast. See you in 2021. Got 10 minutes? We know you do, especially for thought leaders like Biff Naked, Margaret Atwood, Desmond Cole, Amanda Paris, Andre Picard, and the list goes on and on. The Conversation Piece is a new podcast from The Walrus. Subscribe today and get new perspective delivered on the Acast app, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Play.